welcome everyone to the July uh, integration down under. My name is Bill Chestnut and I'm one of the organizers for the integration down under. The other organizers are Martin from Perth, Dan from Brisbane, Renee from Sydney, and Wagner from Auckland. Uh, we've got tonight, we've got Michael Sand from Sweden, um, and he's going to be talking about multi uh, data center redundancy in the Azure PaaS. I've known Michael a long, long time. I don't know where we initially met, but I'm sure it was one of the BizTalk things over in Redmond a long, long time ago. Uh, so he's going to be talking to us tonight, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Michael. And okay, thank you very much. Stop my uh, sharing my screen. Uh, there we go. There we go. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, so there we go. Screen number two. I'm going to share that, and I am going to start my. I can see your uh, postman screen now. Awesome. So there you go. Yay. There we go. Oh, this is very, very strange. Okay. Hmm. So I'm going to see if I can do something here. My, <laughs> there is something strange with the setup. So okay. remember what I told you guys before <laughs> about the last time I did this, everything went wonderfully. <laughs> now I see things properly and in the uh but never mind so i'm gonna stop my video because no one wants to watch uh, me from from the side while i do this so yeah this is a multi-data center redundancy in azure using platform as a service and thank you very much guys for having me this is an uh, an honor and and yeah let's let's hope i can do this uh do a good thing about this so i am michael uh, I work with Azure Integration, uh, and I've been working with BizTalk since like forever. I used to do 10 years of BizTalk up till about five years ago, and then I quit doing that thing and carried on doing Azure-based integration instead. I work as an integration tech lead at the company called Enfo, which is located in Sweden and Finland. So we're very Nordics, if you know what I mean. I'm also a very, very strong advocate for using platform as a service. I really don't like using infrastructure as a service unless I really have to or I'm being forced to, basically. Um, I have a Twitter account uh, at Michael Sand, and I also have a, um, it used to be called a blog or a homepage or something, but it's michaelsand.se or michaelsand.com. So, um, if you wish to contact me after uh, this or in relation to this anyway, do it either using my Twitter account or do it, uh, you can find my contact things on my, my blog. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to, in, in order to understand what we're trying to achieve and, and do, we need to understand a couple of basic things. We're going a bit into academia, so we're going back to university. I'm going to understand what is redundancy and define what redundancy is. Then I'm going to list off and work through all the kinds of challenges that are in the way in building a redundant platform. And then we're going, I'm going to show you the scenario I built. And then, of course, we're going to have a lot of demos, which in this case means clicking through the Azure portal together. So the why is, is a very important thing. Um, why do we do this? Uh, so in October last year, uh, we had two major outages in Azure Europe, and especially the one called West Europe. Um, and what happened was that, you know, no one could access their information all of a sudden. And even though they were offline for, I think, about two hours, so I think the basic thing that happened was that some kind of update to the storage software messed up. And what happened was that no services could access storage, basically. And if storage fails, then, you know, everything fails. And since uh, Enfo is a consultancy company, so a lot of clients came to us and basically said, we don't want this. Uh, how, can we, how can we make this not happen again? How can we have full redundancy? And me working with integration, then of course, the way we're talking about our Azure-based integration platform, 
or the IAS, as they now call it. And there is also a big why is, why is it so hard to get to 100%? If you have something redundant, if you duplicate it, and you still don't have 100%, why? Why is it so hard to get both, to get everything? So let's talk or look a bit about what is redundant. Um, so the first thing that you probably think about is saying that, well, redundancy is basically duplication. You duplicate stuff. And which means that you have everything at least twice. So you can, if you, you remember that if you redundancy in storage or servers in Azure is that it's replicated. Uh, so we have three instances of it. You have one working copy, one direct backup, and then yet another backup. So we have at least three of everything. So that's one way of getting redundancy. But a redundancy is also like services and component components that is not needed to fulfill needs of a solution, which basically means extra stuff. You, you fulfill the needs of your solution by, by incorporating some components or some custom code, but then you have to add a lot of other things in order to get redundancy, and those added things are the redundant stuff. And we also have to remember that redundancy is not only for, for emergencies. It might be that you need to patch, you need to update something, you need to update your code or your, your operating system or whatever. And it might be a good thing to have a redundant copy of, an, of, of something. So the academia thing is basically the inclusion of extra components which are not strictly necessary to functioning in case of failure and other components. But there are some challenges in getting these redundancy and to getting a full on redundant thing. So the first thing that pops up is what's called the BAC theorem. And now we're, now we're back at university because we're using the word theorem. It's very important. BAC stands for backup availability and consistency. And it basically states that when you back up an entire microservices architecture, it's not possible to have both data availability and consistency of data. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means basically this. So you have to imagine that you have built something. You have built an application, you have built an integration or whatever. And from the left, you have usage or data coming in to your application in the middle and it writes to the database. Uh, and this is not very redundant because every time something, uh, every time something were to, to happen, to uh, every time you need to update your, your application, you will have a stop in, in flow. So basically if this box goes away, then no one can use your, your application, right? So what you do is that you, you, you spin up another instance of it. And then when you need to take this one down, you can make everything work just by having this one and so on and so forth. This is kids play especially when using Azure stuff. So what you do is that you, you accelerate onwards, you um, take a look at uh, this and, and you, you implement a, a multi-site or a microservices architecture. And every time you do an update to uh, either of your microservices, the other microservices basically take over and, and process that data. But your database is still uh, still not a good thing because every time you need to do an actual update to the database, you have to stop the inflow. So you can either have consistency of, of data, which basically means then you have to stop all the flow of data and then you have no availability. So you can't have both, right? But then, and, and, and of course, I mean, the database can just go boom. So it doesn't work at all. So what do you do? is that you you decide to um, you decide you decide to uh, have another database and you start a syncing job between the primary and the secondary database so you say one is my primary and the other one is a secondary and therefore um, I now have full availability should I need to update should I need to update my first database in some way I can point all my applications to the second database that can be used and therefore we have full availability however 
going back to the theorem once again, is that if you need to uh, back up your, if you need to make sure that you have consistency of data between both your instances, the first one and the second one, there's always a theoretical possibility of someone having written something to the first database and then you have to manually fail over to the second database and while you do that the request there might be another request which either gets lost or what actually happens is that it never get got synced over to the second database and therefore that request or that data is not there and then you have inconsistency of data and the only way to have full consistency of data is to stop the flow of data and then you have no availability so this is one thing it's very 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 hard to reach 100 percent because it's not possible to have both availability and consistency of data but there are more problems there are two things that we need to know and understand in order to fully understand the uh, the the things I'm going to show you later, and it's called RPO and RTO. So RPO is the return point objective. And this basically means how far back in time do you want to go when you restore a backup? So if you back up every five minutes and you need to, uh, if, you, if you back up every five minutes and you need to restore your database to that backup, you basically travel back in time to how your data looked five minutes ago. So this means that you want to have a low, as low a return point objective as possible. And zero would be ideal. This is basically, uh, I wouldn't say impossible, but that's what we're striving for is that if you need to access your backed up data, your secondary database or whatever, you need to have an RPO of zero. But then there is also, oh, sorry. Uh, so now something happened to my screen here. So like I said uh, before, there are some issues about with my- Yes, so we've lost your screen. Yeah, I'm going to do a reshare and I'm going to reshare uh, the same way I did before here. So let me just see if I can restart my slideshow thingy. Uh, like I said, yep, you're back where this, you were. Thank you. I've done this thing before and now, and then it went well, and now I have to pay the, the demo gods. So there is a slight glitch in, in the cable to my secondary monitor, which is this monitor I'm using. So it will probably happen again, strap in. So then there's the RTO, the return time objective. It basically may, means from how long does it take for you to go from where you go, let's do the restore, or we need to do a restore to the actual time it got restored, right? So if you have an RPO of zero, then your return time objective, if that's, you know, two, three hours, then you still have a total return time of two, three hours, right? So looking at my own, uh, my, uh, uh, so yeah, it's, that's another way of excusing it, uh, of saying how long does it take for the business to get back to normal? So that's the return time objective. Going back to my, my old days in, in BizTalk where everything, I mean, it got really good, but what you usually had was we, we there were logs or log backups every five or 15 minutes. So basically then you have your return point objective. It was always 15 minutes, but the return, time objective was usually a lot longer because there were a lot of people that needed to have their say in what in whether you should do a backup or not so even uh, return uh, rather restore the backup or not so if you had a very you i mean you you backed everything up 15 minutes yeah but there were a lot of people that need to have a lot of meetings so the return time objective was usually some like two two hours, two hours and 30 minutes before we actually got the thing back up because people needed to be sure that they would work. So this is a thing. The next thing is something that is very much, it's, I would say, it's mostly for people that works with, work with integration, especially understand this, this problem. However, it is also a problem if you do regular uh, deploy development as well. And that is keeping state versus 
uh, versus not keeping state. So even if you're not heavily uh, into integration, but keeping state means that it, it still means different things to different people of what exactly it is. So I will use a couple of examples to try to show you um, uh, why keeping state might be an issue in a redundant platform. So the first, oh, now we're glitching out again. So I think I am going to stop using that external screen instead and basically say, you know, let's do everything on this screen and let's just hope that everything just works nicely. Yeah, we see, I'm seeing your PowerPoint uh, yeah. presenter view. There we go. There we go. So, yeah, and now, now I have no notes <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so, uh, therefore, it might be a bit, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, let's go back to this. So, back to, uh, back to like, okay, sure, we need to keep state. And what is state? And, and what are the implications of not keeping state? So, I'm going to disconnect that screen entirely. So there we go. Um, this is an example of not keeping state, basically. You have your API management service on the left. It receives a request. It calls a, a, a middle tier service in something uh, like a logic app or an Azure function. And this in turn calls a backend service and basically does nothing to the message and returns the response. If this were to go down, basically, if, if this became unavailable, the caller would still be able to do the same request again because it didn't get any response back. So we're not, we don't need to keep any state of where in the flow is this, uh, is this integration at the moment and what step. But then there are a very, very easy way of, of just, you know, oh, now we need to keep state. And one of those things is we add a, an Azure service bus. And one logic app simply, you know, sends the message to the Azure service bus and then returns back the response. And then we have another service that calls another logic app to pull that information from the, uh, uh, from the Azure service bus. And now we have to keep the state of the flow because if you send something in here, you need to be able to get that exact information whenever this call happens. It might not be now, it might be two hours, it might be two months down the road. And then we have yet another, and this is just to, to flex a bit. <laughs> but so the, the call comes in through API management, a logic app saves, the, uh, saves whatever information into, uh, into uh, Azure Storage. And Azure Storage then using Event Grid sends out an event to whatever kind of service that wants to use that event. And they either immediately or sometime down the line, they call an Azure function and that Azure function gets that information from the thing here. So we need to keep the state of the information here. Has it been written? Have we sent that uh, event or and has someone tried to get it already and was it successful? That is very important. And you can't simply just do that using, um, using duplication because if you duplicate everything, then you have two storages, right? And you, even though there are some, uh, some redundant ways of how storage is used and, and kept, it's still, still, there's still a primary endpoint, which basically means that should storage go down in Western Europe and you have your, your friend over in Northern Europe that keeps all that information, you still need to repoint all your endpoints to that, to that place. Um, so the data is not lost, it's accessible, but you know, and how do you know if you have everything doubled up, then you have to make sure that you also send the data to the correct storage and the data is also gotten from the correct storage when, when someone then requests that information. 
and it should be either available and then it could still be unavailable because the data was written in western europe and now that data center is gone and then you have to so it's 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 getting quite complex quite quickly in order to do this especially when you then also add things like oh i want to resend that kind of information and so on so let's move from you know posing problems um and try to solve these things instead. So how would, how would I build this? Uh, how would I solve this? Or rather, here's a suggestion on how you, on, on some services that might help you solve these kinds of issues. So the first one is, is a very concrete thing actually. So let's say you have an endpoint. And since this is a very Eurocentric thing, it's of course, it's a West, uh, Western Europe endpoint. Your endpoint is being called by your users. It's a function, it gets data from a storage, fine, right. But then you go, well, I want to do this redundantly. I want to duplicate it. And you have a North Europe endpoint that does the exact same thing. It gets the data from a storage uh, exposing function, but your users, doesn't want to, doesn't know which endpoint to call, which is the primary, which is the secondary, and, and why, um, in what cases should I switch back and forth between these two? They, they don't want to be bothered by those things. But there are, of course, ways of solving this. Otherwise, I wouldn't have posed the issue, right? So I have been looking a lot at the Azure front door. And also, a, before I do this, a quick shout out to you, Bill, for, for helping me that, in your case, quite uh, late evening in, in uh, configuring my first Azure Front Tour. Thank you very much. What is Azure Front Tour? It is a global router for your web traffic. And when I say global, it means also that it's, it doesn't really have a primary endpoint or a primary place in which it resides. It resides everywhere, all throughout Azure. It's kind of like a god in that aspect, you know. But it's also an instant global failover. So, I mean, even though it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere and nowhere, it's actually on some server somewhere, right? Sure, but if that server becomes unavailable, there are a lot of other services that's basically hosting your service as well in order to, to handle the request that comes in. This is something that a friend of mine wanted me to write. I don't really know what that means, uh, but he was very adamant in pointing out that I have to say that it works on layer seven. It's also similar to other load balancers and, and things that are available in Azure. So there's uh, the traffic manager, which has been out since forever. There's also the application gateway and the Azure load balancer. And Azure front door is, I wouldn't say a bit late to the party, but it, it's really not been released as an Azure service since it's been out for like a year or somewhere. But someone told me that it's actually been used for the Xbox network for about 10 years. So it's a very, very, uh, very tested, uh, tested and true service. So how do I choose between all these kinds of uh, things? And actually they, they made an, a flow chart for you to be able to, to choose which kind of, of, um, of traffic manager you wanna use. So we're going to build a service that uh, starts with API management. So someone will be calling an API and therefore, I mean, uh, we are then building a web application. Will it be uh, internet facing? Yes, it will be facing the internet. Everyone should be able to call this. Will I deploy this in multiple regions? Well, this is the way that we're trying to solve redundancy, right? We are going to duplicate stuff and therefore it will be deployed in multiple regions. And will you require SSL offload, blah, 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 blah. No, we will not actually. So, and it's also asking, are we hosting this as a pass? And we are hosting it as a pass. And therefore we're arriving at the Azure front door. So this is a good thing to, you know, use uh, 
it's very Googleable. Just search for you know um, something like uh, Azure Load Balancer Flowchart or something, and you will find this. So going back to this thing where you have your very very confused users going North Europe, West Europe, North Europe, West Europe, then you add your front door endpoint instead, and you you point your users to your front door endpoint and say, just use this. I'll take care of everything for you. And then you can configure your front door in a lot of ways. One way of configuring your front door is to say, I want to use the North Europe endpoint as much as possible until it becomes unavailable. Then I want to shift over to the West Europe endpoint, which is basically saying you have like an active passive cluster or something. But you can also actually configure it as an active active cluster because you can basically tell Azure Front Door to say, you know, split them between the two. I don't care. Um, favor North Europe if you want to, but they're equal. So going back to Louis the 14th and, and the states, so how do we keep the state redundantly? Because we have to save the data in a centralized store. And why do we do this? Well, going back to the, the whole scenario with how you say uh, saving data in a Azure storage, then if you duplicate the storage, then you also have to start and finish that integration within the same uh, within the same region within the same azure data center and the reason for that is you can only access the data from that data center so we need to save it in a central store and uh, i don't know if any more beside the two guys we've already seen before has uh, has any experience with this talk but this is actually how BizTalk works, or rather how a BizTalk in a high availability cluster works, because you have multiple servers that write to a centralized store, the, Azure, the, the, the BizTalk message box. So that exact same thing, we want to do that, and we want to save the data in a centralized store. And how do we do that? Well, we use the awesome, awesome service, Cosmos DB. And Cosmos DB, has been around for a while, as you all know. And now they also added a functionality called Multimaster. And Multimaster gives you a 99.999. Once again, is very hard, close to impossible to get to 100% SLA. That 99.999 is in the 99th percentile, I think. With, they guarantee that that is the percentage amount of messages that will be written in every region that you have configured Cosmos DB to use within uh, a, I think it's uh, 10 milliseconds or something or 15 milliseconds or whatever. And I say whatever because as a, as, a, as a guy that's not that into databases and, and infrastructure, and I don't have to care. I don't, I don't need to. I don't need to care. I just say, hey, I want this configured as a multimaster. I want one place to be in the Eastern US, and I want one to be in Western Europe. And, you know, go. And the, the problem they actually have with getting to 100% is the speed of light because there is still a very minute delay before some data that is written in the east of US has been synced over the Atlantic to West Europe. So if we basically, basically understanding that going faster than the speed of light seems to have a, a very strange effect on time, so if Microsoft had discovered a way to travel faster than the speed of light, I can guarantee you they either would do something else besides computers. So this is a very high level version of what I would then propose. Please excuse, oh, sorry, God, I hope rest in peace headphone users. I, excuse me that for the very Eurocentric uh, version of this, uh, that's where I live. So that's why everything becomes Europe. And also these are images, so I wasn't able to update them. So this is how you could then keep state. 
So you have your Azure front door, which is being called by service. The Azure front door points to either of your API, uh, API management endpoints, which in this case is West Europe. That, that thing executes code either in a function or a logic app or whatever, and it writes the data to a Cosmos DB configured as multimaster. And should you feel the need to either manually or, 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 or not a failover to North Europe, that data that was written in the Cosmos, uh, Cosmos Multimaster thing is still available because it's centralized. It's centralized and distributed. And I don't have to care. Once again, if I, if I configure Cosmos DB to use the Multimaster thing, it's, you know, I have one endpoint one one connection string or whatever saying use this thing here and i will take care of everything for you under the covers and it's efficient i gotta tell you and before anyone uh, asks the question about pricing and saying that cosmos is 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 uh, expensive it's not as expensive as doing the same thing but using sql server that's all i have to say so now we're going into the demo part of this and let's let's now hope that this goes well uh, oh yeah before <laughs> before so this is the setup for the demo i have configured an azure front door that is configured to use a uh, an api management instance that is in the east eastern us it calls an a logic app which writes into the message where it was written and then saves it to Cosmos. I will then try to make a configuration failover so it fails over to West Europe and we can see that it writes the same thing into West Europe and you can still access uh, the data, of course. So, uh, oh yeah, that, that was the next thing. So let's see if I can do this thing here. So here we have Postman, and here we have everything in. Uh, go away, please. Yeah, there we go. So I have, sorry, this is a, my East US API management endpoint. And it has one API called economic transaction. It takes a post that submits, that I submit information to and sends it to the backend, which is an Azure Logic App called Fade Over Test. And then I have the same thing in uh, the Western Europe thing. So these are, they look exactly the same actually. And then we have the Azure front door. And when you, you start up your first Azure front door, it will walk you through these three steps. Because this is basically what it is. One is that you have a front end domain. So this is, if you were to call my service, you would then use this endpoint here. And then you define back end pools. And back end pools are uh, pools of services within Azure. And I pre configure this one here to use failover. So these are my, my, um, my backend hosts. So it's, you can all see that says Azure API net.net. So it's API management. If you were to add a yet another, you could easily do that by saying add backend. And this is the thing that I truly, truly like is that if I do this and choose API management, you can all see that it's traffic manager and app service and so on. But if I choose API management, it looks through my subscription for other API management instances and basically pre-configures everything for you, which I think it's very cool. I have to open that again. Um, then you also have to give all your, if you're using API management or using whatever web endpoints or whatever, you have to uh, open a, some kind of place for it to do a health probe. And this is like every five seconds, it sends a get to this path here saying, basically checking if it's alive or not. And if it's not alive, then it will add to automatically, you take it out of commission and then point everything to the other one. Should uh, neither be available, it round robins everything, you know, every other, it goes back and forth. So what I've configured this thing here is to have a guaranteed that it will always use my East US one. It has priority one 
and has a weight of a thousand. And then I have the Western Europe thing as a backup. And lastly, we're also using something called routing rules. And routing rules is basically saying if someone sends in a pattern that matches this, I will use this backend pool. So here you can do things like if you were to say, let's say for, for instance, that you have a you have a large website and you have your APIs, you can have slash API star, it will send everything to your API management back uh, back uh, sorry backend pool, and then you have your web thing sending to the web backend pool if you want to reconfigure that here. So that is the basic setup. Uh, I've done some other things which I will go through given time, which I don't think I have. But never mind. I'll do this. And then I'll. So what's the next thing? Oh, yeah, sure. The next thing then is to call my API. And my API is so looking at the screen. If you zoom in a bit, you can see that it's basically said Michael Sand demo and it says Azure FD.net, which is Azure Front Store. And then I use the root thing and it goes economy transaction submit. And then you, I use Postman to send in information and we will get back some kind of information here. And this information here will tell us where this order was written. I also recommend you, if you are using Postman, but haven't been using this feature in going for the uh, the random things. So you can you can do a, a Google search for this, but basically what this is, is it's it fills in a random price or a random first name or a random last name or a random bank account so that you can, you know, generate some kind of, 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 uh, of different data between your different requests. So you don't, you know, you have the classic thing is you have like one small and one very large order. And that's what you send through. So here instead, uh, and also you can, I think you can figure out what random BS stands for. Well, this is basically then generated. I click send. And I receive back uh, information saying that uh, I got a 200 OK and it was written in the East US and it has this order ID. So, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, of course. I'm going to go here. I am not going to show you the logic app because I can't reach it. That was cool. So let's see if I can do that using tabs or, uh, so that was, yeah, this, this is it. I refresh it and this is local time. It's 1138 and we can see that it runs this thing through here and I've got a, I got the request with all the information, blah, 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 blah. Going on down here, we have create and update documents and it basically calls the, uh, the, the Cosmos DB and sends this information here. And if I were to look into the Cosmos database, I have, uh, I have my Logic apps, let's call it a database here. It's got some other name, I think container or something. And if I do a refresh, I, we can see that if I look at it, it says order ID 464, blah, 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 97. And going back here, you can say 464, blah, 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 97. And that's, that's basically it. So now I will try to initiate a, a failover. And as everyone then can understand, I will take, might take some time before that thing actually kicks in. So before that, I'm going to, so let's see, you go here and I'm basically saying, you know, no, this endpoint, it needs, it needs work. We need to take it down or whatever. So I'm going to disable it. I click update and click update again. And then I need to click save. And uh, there it goes. I'm going to see if I can fix my electricity for my computer. Well, that didn't work. Let's, let's speed through before my battery runs out. 
you can see that everything was updated. Now it will take a while before this kind of realizes that, oh, this is, this is down. I, I, need to, I need to switch over. So if I were to do an immediate thing here, it will probably come back as an East US, though it takes a bit of time. So I know it might also be that it, it realizes that, oh, this is wrong. So let's see, no, it still says East US. And then, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking about something else in between. <laughs> and yeah, it still says East US, whoa, good. So there we go, ah, power, finally. And it still will still say East US for a while. So before we are looking to do that, I will show you some other things with the Azure Front Tour. Because the Azure Front Tour has been growing since its release uh, about a year ago. So you can do a couple of kind of cool, but still infrastructure as a service related stuff. But I think it's an added benefit. So if you have an API management thing running today, one of those things which you're actually sadly missing is basic, you know, protection from not denial of service attacks, because I think Azure, uh, the Azure uh, firewall takes care of th those things, but there are still some kind of nasty stuff up there. So I personally haven't been hacked, or as far as I know, none of my API instances has had any issues with it. But if you add your uh, Azure, uh, Azure Front Door in front of it, you can do things like add a web application firewall or what's usually called a WAF or a WAF. And what this is, is that it's another service, it's called web application firewall. And I have decided to, show, uh, to, to um, name mine HeProtec. And this is the firewall. And I have policy settings in here. No, I have not policy settings in there, I have managed rules. So there are a couple of basic, so I have not added all these rules. I have no idea what like 95% of these means because I basically added what's called the default rule set. And these are constantly updated by Microsoft and the, as new threats arrive, they will add it. So if I add this to what's called a policy, then I can add that policy to my Azure Front Door and that Azure Front Door can then protect my APIs in a very much more HTTP layer six, layer six or layer seven uh, version of stuff. And I've also, you can also do custom rules here. Um, and what I did is that I, I, I'm not exactly sure this actually works 100%, but what I'm saying is that if someone tries to, uh, to, um, to go to this endpoint and it's not from this IP address, which is basically my place of work, then I will deny all the traffic. So I basically locked everything down in a very hard uh, fashion. This is not a, a very, this is, like I said, it's very hard. Uh, using things like IP addresses feels very 2010. Um, so, but you can still add these web application firewall things, which I personally think is a very cool thing. And let's go back here and see if it updated. And it, now it says West Europe. Um, which then means that everything was then handled by the West Europe instance instead. So let's check that out. Uh, it's control tab, right? So this is my Western Europe uh, logic app. You can see the location is Western Europe. I click refresh and we have one 1144, which was right about now. And you can see that, yeah, sure, they took some time, but it was able to write to the, uh, to the Cosmos DB, of course which is not the, not the hard part. So I am going to go back to my presentation because that was the end of the demo. Please give it a shout if you have any questions as we said it before. So making it work for you. So this is, this is the hard part, I would say, basically before, before you now rush off and say, you know, oh, this is very cool. We just add Azure Front Door. We have multiple instances. Everything just work. Michael told us it was awesome. You have to also think about things like deployment. 
because if you need to, if you have a good CI CD story at your company, then, you know, having multiple regions being deployed to that is, that is not, you know, that is not a problem. But if you don't, then you have to remember that you have to, you know, oh, I, I must deploy this thing to uh, my first and second data center. Every time you do anything and the first time you become out of sync, then you, you know, you're going to have a bad time. I have stories about this, but I'm not going to tell you now. Also remember access rights. If you have one, um, one managed instance of Azure, uh, um, managed, if you have one API management instance in one place, then it has access rights to some kind of, you know, let's say logic apps or functions. You have to make sure that it does the same thing in your other, inst in your other uh, data center. There are also things like your, your, your developers should be able to log into both data centers and basically both subscriptions and see both things. There's also the weakest link thing. I mean, if I have two awesome data centers, I've been, I have five nines in, in my, in my data, database with Cosmos DB, everything is, is working awesomely. Then if I still call like an on-premise thing that's hosted on one server and they constantly need to update that because they're still running Windows on that server, which needs to be patched. And as soon as they do a restart, my five nines counts for nothing if I can't get that data from the on-premise thing. So you have to remember that when you when you think about or you design your your flows. Um, there's also some services in Azure that needs to be connected using uh, networks. So there's of course VPN ways of co uh, of, of contacting or, or marrying networks. Um, then there is also the on-premise data gateway, which has a dependency on which region you have deployed it to. So you can't reuse your, uh, your, your on-premise data gateway between regions. You have to have multiple of those, which means you have to have multiple instances of that installed uh, in the data center. And of course, lastly, let's say for instance, that you're calling a software as a service, but it's hosted in, in Western Europe. And I mean, you, quite easily you just turn over to your, your Australia 2 thing, but your service that you're calling, that software as a service is hosted in Western Europe. So that's down as well. So further study, yeah, um, I made a paper and it's not been, you know, it's not flying off the presses. It's not flying off the shelves because it's, uh, it's about 18 pages about things that we're talking about now. Um, if you were to uh, be interested uh, in, in reading or getting your hands on this paper, please send an email at that address, which is on screen now. I also want to uh, point out that within this paper, I also take a look at things like you grading your, your different flows that not all flows need to be, you know, fully redundant perhaps, but only a couple of them. Um, and also other ways of doing this just by, instead of just having everything has a, be in a constant active, active cluster. And yeah, by that, um, actually my slideshow is over and my prepared material over. I have some additional uh, things I can show you with the after front door, which I kind of like. Uh, but Bill, are there any questions? Um, no, there's no question so far. Um, yep. And uh, as you I know, have one. Oh, actually, oh. there's one right now. Oh. Is this layout to do layout? Do you use uh, Azure uh, API Man premium multi-region support, or is it two separate instances? Yeah, that is a very very good question. So I am doing a hacky thing actually. So one of those things, of course, is that if I, if I shoot, um, if I shoot something to this endpoint, it still needs to be authenticated. And you usually do that by using an API key or something, you know, uh, and that API key must be the same for all your subscriptions in API management. 
However, API management supports API or the management API, which is you know, a mouthful. And what you can do is that you can actually set the, um, you can set subscription keys for uh, be uh, between different instances. So that's what I did because I'm cheap and I didn't want to pay for the whole premium thing. <laughs> so that's what I've done. And, and it's, it's, it's a quite an easy thing. You, you simply send away a patch to, to this where you say, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to set the primary and secondary key to those things using uh, uh, use for this particular subscription. And in this case, it's the master key. And yes, I will remove all these instances later. But feel free to hack my, <laughs> my things while this thing is going on. So that's how I solved this one. The other way I've done it, Michael, is you can actually do a, if the one customer I wanted, they wanted most of the, the activity to go the Australia Southeast, but yep. they wanted to use Australia East as their backup. Yep. So what we did is when we deployed anything new to API management, we did a backup and restore to the Australia East yep. instance, and that got all of the API keys and everything that you needed um, to be replicated in that way yeah. we could use um, the standard edition or a basic edition to where it's mm -hmm. not costing a lot of money. Yeah, sure. No, yeah, the, the, the cost of premium is a, a premium thing, but if, if you're using premium, they, they will basically handle that for you, especially now with all the, the gateway thing that they're adding. Um, I mean, premium, it's, it's good value if you, you have the money. Uh, there was another question, I think, as well. No, that's just one. That was the only question. Now it's just about the. Actually, the, the I think I, I, actually, I was I was going to ask a question. Yep. Sure. Shoot. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between Front Door and Traffic Manager, which is also a global resource? Yeah. So I, I would say the Traffic Manager thing it works a bit differently. I'm going to show you this whole flow chart again, because that is how I decided upon it. So Traffic Manager is here, and it says it's basically it's if you're not using an internet-facing application that you have globally deployed, then you're going to use the uh, Azure Manager Plus Load Balance Traffic Manager Plus Load Balancer which I, I, I'm not entirely, I don't entirely agree with that personally. I, I would like to use the traffic manager thing if you have an internet facing application as well. Oh, it's a web application. Yeah, sorry. Reading from the paper, Michael, that was, that was hard. Uh, yeah, so it's an internet facing, uh, internet facing application. It works a bit differently because I think it basically works on the DNS level, right? So it, it uh, updates that, your, your DNS registry to say, oh, no, use this endpoint instead or something. Yeah, it's, it's all DNS-based. And um, the biggest problem is that it's very slow in responding to failures. It's, oh. got, it's got like a five-minute window of the DNS. Um, so it's, that's one of the issues that people have had with it. But again, it was there from the, the start. And it basically um, is what um, API management premium under the covers is using something similar. Mm -hmm. um, but basically um, the front door has got so, so much better control over your, uh, your probing path for your health because you can do either head or get, um, you, can put a, you can put a lot more into um, detecting failures um, with front door than you can with traffic manager. Sure, I didn't know that. But there are other features in Azure front door as, as well, which I kind of, you know, this, this is a thing I want, <laughs> which is uh, I like the rules engine, which has been added. Uh, and what I do in my rules engine, just to, just to show it, what I did is that I do an IP match for my work IP. And I'm not entirely sure that I actually have that exact IP at the moment, but never mind. So uh, there's also geo matches and geo not matches, which you know is a good way of then saying you know at doing something. So I, what I do is that I append a request header, which I call info IP check, and just to say that it's okay, just to see that. But you can all you can do other 
things with this as, as well. You can add your own headers, basically saying this request comes from some other place in the world, which you're, you're not used to. Um, so the rules engine is, is also very good. And of course, then, you know, you add the web application firewall. I think going down the line, they will add some kind of web application firewall uh, functionality out of the box for API management. It's just what I, I think going forward. Uh, you can do this now, but I think you can then add um, add additional uh, functionality. Yeah, so the, um, the second question was they people want the location of that flowchart that you showed. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so the location is, this is how I always find it. <laughs> I go... Uh, Azure front door flow chart. It was and funny. Uh, I, I used yeah. that say I used that same flow chart in, to, in the training I did today for a, oh. a local customer. <laughs> Good. So, so that's that's how I, I find it usually. I just Google for 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 the flow chart, and there there you have it. Um, there is really there there might also be a good reason as to this this slow chart is not 100 percent there when it comes to integration because i kind of feel that you could also add the application gateway behind the after front door in some cases and it kind of depends on what you're using and how you're using your services i have seen um I have seen people putting application gateway in front of API management in order to get the same functionality you were get you would get from the Azure front door, but those are cases where they are very very restrictive when it comes to everything being in the network. So of course they have their premium API management and then they put the application gateway in front of it because well it's basically they are using it for everything else. So that's why. There, so using it. There, the, the big difference between front door and application gateway hmm? is front door is public IP to public IP. Yep. Application gateway is public IP to private IP. Yep. And it also, since it's a private IP, you need to then, of course, being able to connect that to a, a, a VNet or a network. Yeah, that's the way you get a private IP is VNet. Yep. So it's, it's really... Um, public to public or, and then the application gateway one is public to VNet. I fully agree. So, yep. And then we have a comment about a great session. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you very much for attending. Um, and uh, whoops, I'm going to do that. Sure. But other than that, I, that's basically it. I would like to point people to my, um, my blog, uh, michaelsand.com, you works. Uh, I've been blogging a lot about uh, using OAuth um, lately and how you configure your, your services, and especially in this case, of course, API management to use uh, OAuth. So you can use OAuth uh, 2.0 and get a, a very good uh, protection of your, your API management. What have you uh, been using for your OAuth provider? I've been using uh, Azure. Okay. We've been doing a lot of work right uh, recently with a customer using the Azure B2C, and I'd be interested yeah. in plugging that guy in sure. to yeah. uh, API management too. Yeah, I've been using Azure uh, Active Directory basically and doing the whole thing, you know, registering applications and, and having them talk to one another and expose APIs and giving them access rights and so on and so forth. Which I, I mean, given given interest, I, I could do a session about that uh, sometime uh, down the line as well. But okay, I am burning to get back to my vacation because it's vacation <laughs> time in Sweden, and 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 therefore, you know, now now it's the time to uh, have an ice cream and and perhaps a beer tonight. Yep, Instead and I'm just going to share my screen real quick, and so. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for this presentation. It was really good. Uh, it was timely because I've been doing training on a lot of these topics recently for a customer. So I will point them also to your talk because it's a good one because they're doing a lot of stuff in that similar fashion. Um, and I don't think there's any more questions. So thank you very much. And um, we will have the recording up probably in the next day or so on that um, www.integrationdownunder.com.
So if you want to find it from there. Um, and uh, thank you very much again. And that's pretty much it for tonight. Okay. Bye then. Have okay. a great day. Thank you. Bye, Mike. Bye.